I am Tom Behin, I'm a pianist researcher, and I'm sitting here at the first ever modern replica of Beethoven's 1817 Broadwood. And I'm Thomas Wolfrank, I'm an acoustic engineer, and together with Tom, we carried out acoustic measurements of this very Broadwood piano. When Beethoven first received his Broadwood, he felt immediately attracted to it, and he kept using it until the end of his life. Surprisingly so, because before he had been largely accustomed to playing Viennese instruments, and this is an English piano. There's also the issue of his deafness, so it could not have been the English sound per se that would have attracted Beethoven to this piano in the first place. When Tom first got in touch with me, he told me he was very much excited about the vibration response of the piano, about the tactile experience. And so we decided to carry out some vibration measurements in different points of the piano. And the conclusion was, indeed, that the Broadwood piano vibrates up to 10 times stronger than a typical Viennese piano of that same period. So Beethoven would have felt this piano more than he could actually hear it. And a good example of that we find in his Opus 109 Sonata, where Beethoven constantly oscillates between what we like to call good notes versus bad notes, tata, 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 and he builds up. It grows and grows almost obsessively so. At some moment, you can even see the piano rock back and forth. What you've heard so far is with the classic original piano lid, which projects the sound coming out of the piano sideways to where the audience typically sits. That's how, over the course of the last centuries, we've gotten used to listening to a piano. However, for a deaf performer like Beethoven, it must have been disastrous to not hear all this sound. And that's why, in 1820, together with the Viennese piano builder André Stein, they conceived of a Gehörmaschine a hearing machine that amplifies the sound and sits on top of the Broadwood. Are we good? Yep, a bit more like this. Oh, a bit backwards. Yes, that's perfect. Good, perfect. So when the machine made it to Beethoven's house, Beethoven had already finished actually writing his Opus 109 sonata. So the next sonata he would write would be Opus 110. And there we find him with an entirely different focus. Now he's clearly listening to sounds as they come from this new, come back from this uh, new hearing machine. Uh, so you have that opening chord with the third on top. He's listening. Hey, I can hear this. He lingers on it as if relishing in, in the new experience. Then you have that trill, a long trill, and you can easily imagine Beethoven putting his head in and out of the hearing machine. Also visually, we, we're, we're looking at this big arch, and I believe that Beethoven got inspired to write an opening melody that imitates the shape of a curve. Then you have those cascading, tiptoeing down and up arpeggios, also circular figures.
later in the sonata, there's remarkable moments. There's a timeout. And Beethoven plays a series of 10 identical chords in G major, una corda, with one string, for absolute purity of sound. And then crescendo, chomp, 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 almost as a self-conducted hearing test. Beethoven's hearing machine clearly would have been very useful for him, but for Tom's recording we needed something that sounded less harsh, less boomy. Something that keeps the idea of projecting the sound backwards to the performer, but sounds more open, more beautiful. So we designed this backwards projecting flexible lid that keeps the clarity of Stein's hearing machine while avoiding the negative effects. Something, in other words, that has an added benefit also for the hearing, for the well-hearing performer or listener. Yes, exactly. Yeah, in my work with you, Thomas, trying out several versions of hearing machines, I've grown convinced that playing those late Beethoven sonatas with this Broadwood, with a version of a hearing machine in place, we get a glimpse into the actual artistic genesis of those pieces. And I think we experience them in the fullest possible way. Um, we not only hear the sounds, but we also feel them, as it were, and we also see them. In Opus 111, which is Beethoven's last sonata, uh, in the second movement, just before the return of the theme, the famous Arietta, there's a moment where Beethoven seems to be throwing little snippets of sound against the lid, trills, little appoggiaturas. And then the opening theme returns. And at that moment, it seems like you're being engulfed by a single big wash of sound. It seems like time and space are being transcended at that moment. Yes, this is a 